Amen. Well, um, you know what? I like weddings. I like weddings. I know, I know all men, all, you know, boys and stuff. That, now, I didn't grow up liking weddings, but I like weddings. Anybody else like weddings? Yeah, all the ladies and a few fellas, all right. <laughs> okay, well, we need a little audience participation. What's your favorite thing? about a wedding. I, I know one of my wife's favorite thing, I'm not saying her only favorite thing, but I know one of the things she looks forward to. Um, and she loves the bride and the groom and all that good stuff, but there's this sweet thing called a cake, yeah. yeah. <laughs> she just said, go ahead and say it. Um, anybody else? Shout out your favorite part. Anybody like the cake? Who liked the cake? When the groom, you like, sees, the bride. When the groom sees the bride, it's just like wham, bam. Okay, anybody else's favorite part? Vows. Vows. That's heavy right there, boy, but yeah, that's deep, that's deep. Uh, the vows are always challenged. They will be challenged. Um, anybody else's favorite part? I was gonna say, like, it's the groom here and the, and the, it's the maid of honor and the, it just feels very relaxed. The bridal party, the bridal, that brother about to name all of them, the groom, the second <laughs> maid of honor, the third. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His helpmate helped him. Just, just say the bridal party, brother. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, 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 I like weddings, and I will confess, I, my favorite part in the whole thing is uh, I love newlyweds. I love newlyweds, and man, me and my sweet wife Karen, we've gotten to. In several states, we've gotten to talk to so many couples. I've gotten the privilege. I don't even know how, how many I have, but it's been a lot of weddings that I have gotten to uh, perform. I, and the thing I love about newlyweds is they always, they always want to be alone together. It's, I mean, even, the, you know, before they get married, they all on each other, and, and, you know, they just always together, and you got to tell them, you know, like, hey, man, y'all need to get a little time, you know, for that, and that's another sermon, okay? That's another whole series, but, but, but you know, y'all need to wait until you say I do for all that. We just going through premarital, and y'all can't keep your hands off each other, and then, uh, but the thing I love about newlyweds is that, uh, for the most part, they can't keep their hands off of each other. They always want to be uh, together, especially alone together, obvious reasons, another sermon, uh, but they, they love to be alone together, and so um, I just did some, you know, just looked online and looked for some pictures for newlyweds and I found a random, this random picture, you just type in newlyweds and I found this random picture. Can we put that up there? It was just a random, y'all clapping. That does look like Tori a little bit and it's funny that it looked like Janae a little bit too. That's that is. That's Tori and Janae. Leave that up there for for, for a minute. That's a beautiful, it's a beautiful picture. Um, my question is, why are you looking at that picture? I mean, the man is just fresh, and the lady is just even more beautiful. I mean, like this is as close to a perfect picture that I could think of. Got the velvet, bro. Where that velvet at? You took, oh, you took it back? It was, it was, it was, no, he said, I, I'm just messing with you. <laughs> what is it, though, that makes most, not all, most newlyweds become addicted to each other's embrace? You can see that in the picture. They are addicted to one another's embrace, no matter what. What makes them addicted to one another's embrace? I'm actually going to walk around a little bit. Now, 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 I got some questions about this picture. What is it that makes them so... Um, is it the, the law? Is it their, 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 uh, uh, the marriage license? Is that what does it? It's the law, the marriage license. You know, I signed so many marriage licenses, and I had already signed their marriage license at this point. Was it the marriage license that made them hold one another like that? What, was it what, what, what Zach said? Was it the bridal party? Was it the bridal party that makes a 
newly wedded couple. I mean, this is fresh off of I do. Is it the bridal party? It's like, hey, man, y'all better hug each other. Y'all better kiss each other, man. And I mean it, man. What y'all doing? Uh, I, here, here's another one. It's the photographer. Now, the photographer, he arranges things or she arranges things. But I guarantee you, the photographer did not have to force them to do that. Did, did he have to force it? Like, y'all bet. Look, what are y'all? No, no, look, 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 safe, kiss, that's beautiful. Listen, y'all, uh, the photographer did not have to force those newlyweds to be addicted to one another's embrace. Uh, the, 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 the bridal party didn't have to force those newlyweds to be addicted to one another's embrace. The marriage certificate, the law under the state did not have to force them to be addicted to one another's embrace embrace. There is this burning heart love for each other. That's what it is. There is a burning heart love for one another. I call it they were addicted to one another's embrace, Dante. They were addicted to one another's embrace, and it cannot keep them apart. There's almost something uh, electric if you try to put your hand in between a newly married man and woman. You can almost slice this the thick electric love until life happens. Be take off the picture. Until differences happen, until conflict happens. And then what do they need? The marriage license to get that love back? They got to go to the law. What do they need? Friends. What do they need? People to force them? No. The same thing that kindled that love, just that passionate desire for one another, they need that rekindled. They need that heart love to get relit. They need that romance to be rekindled. And if you know Jesus, I've been talking about you the whole time. If you've been knowing him for a while. Church, I'm talking about us because we are the bride of Christ. And as a man, when I first read that in the scripture, I'm like, hold up, man, hold up. I'm, I'm, you, don't you mean I'm the groom? Jesus said, ain't but one groom, bro. So men in the room, brothers in the room, males in the room that know the Lord Jesus, you better get comfortable with being a bride <laughs> because it's not about male or female. There's neither male or female bond. Or re you know, the, all of us are one in Christ. We are his loved bride. Please hear me. I want you to hear me. Being a follower of Jesus, this statement blew me away as I meditated on this, Jen. I pray that you would get this. Holy Spirit, help us to get this. Holy Spirit, help us. Being a follower of Jesus is all about a deep, intimate relationship of love between a bride and a groom. I want you to get that. Young people, get that. Being, because there's a lot of different ideas about what it means to follow Jesus, being a follower of Jesus is all about a loving relationship between a bride and a groom. Do we have Ephesians 5? Let's go to Ephesians 5. Let me just read that. I'm going to put some verses up here. Listen to what it says. Look at this. It says, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. This refers to Christ and the church. What you just saw between Tori and Janae, every marriage is actually a picture of the relationship between Christ and the church. Even if you just look at that verse, the man will leave his father. Jesus Christ was always in eternity with his father. But the father sent Jesus. Jesus, just like a husband is supposed to leave his father and mother, Jesus left his father. This is a picture of marriage, y'all, to be united to his wife. 
Jesus came from heaven, sent on a mission uh, to look for a people, to look for men and women, boys and girls, who would give him their hearts. This is what Christianity is about. This is what it means to follow Jesus Christ. God the Father sent this husband from heaven to come and get a bride, to be united to himself so that they could be one. Jesus, not only does he want your heart, he wants everything. He wants to be one with you. Somebody say one. one. There, you can't get more intimate than oneness. Jesus wants to be one with you. He wants intimacy with you. Look, from Genesis to Revelation, all of Scripture point to a wedding, a marriage. Did you know that? The Bible starts with a marriage, and it ends with a marriage feast. In Genesis chapter 1 and 2, it starts with Adam and Eve, a man and a woman becoming one. In Revelation 19, did you know that in the new world, one of the first things we're going to do as the church is something called the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's a wedding reception. From beginning to end, Christianity, the heart of God, the plan of God is about a wedding. Before anything and, and beyond anybody, God loves weddings. God loves marriage. It's his favorite picture to describe what he's up to in the world. God the Father has sent his son to get a wife so that he can bring his wife to the wedding feast and they can enjoy the new world forever. This is what Christianity is about. Can you put that picture of Tori and Janae back up real quick? I want to ask a question and the Lord challenged me. The Lord challenged me. The Lord challenged me with this so sweetly, though, but he broke me almost into tears. He said, Hampton, is that the way you view your relationship with me? Jesus is the groom. We are the bride. There is no space between Tori and Janine. This is Christianity. Forget what you heard. It's not about the marriage license. It's not about the law. Did you read your Bible, the Ten Commandments, and all of that? It's not about going to church. It's not about praying. You do all of that out of love because of that embrace. Following Jesus is about intimacy, like between a newly married man and a woman. Do you view Christianity like that? Do you view your relationship with God like that? If you don't know God, he's brought you here this morning because he wants you to be intimate with him because that's what you were created to do. And when we first enter into this covenant relationship of burning love, through the blood of Jesus, nothing can keep us apart. Some of us remember that if you really know Jesus and when you first met him and you entered into this relationship and you were the newly, uh, 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 the new wife and, and he's the new groom and you are experiencing his love for the first time, nothing can keep you from your savior. We, 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 we're talking, we, 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 we first enter into that relationship and we keep talking to the lover of our souls. And we, we get into the 66 books, and it's not the law, it's the love letter. Let me see what my loving husband wrote to me. And then, some of us, we even fast. We stop eating, stop, put, shut down the social media. We put the food away because we feel there's a threat to the intimacy, and we don't want a threat to the intimacy, so we put aside the things that are trying to threaten the intimacy, and then we start witnessing because we see other brothers and sisters, we see other people who we know that they would love the embrace of our new groom, and so we can't help but to invite them into his embrace. It's not the law. It wasn't the marriage license. It's not nobody forcing us to do it. It's just out of love that we're talking to the lover of our souls. It's out of love that we're reading his love letter. It's out of love that we are uh, 
putting away things to distract us. It's out of love that we are inviting each other into his embrace. Just like the newly married couple, though. Somebody say, until. Until, until life happens. Until lust happens. Until trials happen. Until lesser loves happen. Did you know that one of God's main ways to describe the unfaithfulness of his people is to graciously but seriously call us spiritual adulterers? Adultery? God uses a harsh word throughout the Old Testament when his people turn from him. And the Bible readers know that I'm not just making it up. He calls us whores. I didn't, but he does. And this is what he's been speaking to me. I brought my stool because I just want to invite y'all into some of the things that the Lord has spoken to my heart, and maybe he'll speak the same to you. So let's walk through some verses. Re uh, Jeremiah 2. I'll put that on the screen. Y'all can just look at it on the screen and... You know, don't feel the need to write notes. Don't feel the read to need to follow things. I really believe today the Holy Spirit just wants us to lock into what he's saying. Feel free to do that. But I just want to share my heart and I'll put the verses up here if that's okay. Uh, Jeremiah 2, 1 through 2. Uh, the Lord says to his people, look at that. He says, I remember your devotion as a young bride. That's what it says. I remember your devotion as a young bride. How you loved me and followed me through the wilderness. The Lord has a memory. And at that time, the children of Israel, like most times, you know your Old Testament, those of you who read the Old Testament, you know that almost other, every other week they were with Baal, false worship. God had to call them whores and spiritual adulterers and and the Lord he's not mad and this, this he says I remember that's not the tone of an angry husband that's the tone of a broken-hearted husband he says I remember I remember when we first got married the Lord said I remember when we first got married and he says you loved me when we first got married, you loved me, Kempton. You, 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 you couldn't keep me off of your mind. You couldn't keep me out of your mouth. You couldn't keep, keep yourself out of my word. You couldn't help but to invite others into my embrace. You loved me when you were a young bride. And then he said, he, you followed me through the wilderness. The wilderness represents dry times, hard times, times when you don't see God. You don't know where he is. You don't know where his voice is. He said, you didn't start doubting and you didn't go drinking. You didn't go smoking and you didn't, you, you followed me. Remember when I sent you through those early hard times and you still followed me? You still read my word. You still told people about me. The Lord is remembering. Then look at Revelation 2. This is what he spoke to me, Revelation 2. He says, Kempton, I'm sharing my story. You have left the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. And the Lord has to regularly tell me this because I'm a straying pastor. I'm still a sheep. I didn't become a lion when I became a pastor. I'm still a sheep and I still, I'm still prone to stray away. And he says, you left the love you had at first. You couldn't keep me off your mind. You always talked about me. You were always in my word. You said no to a lot of things that you say yes to now. I don't know who that was for. That's not in my notes. You said no to a lot of things that you say yes now and over time it's like ah. but in that fresh love you was like no uh-uh not out of law remember not about the it's not about the the, the 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 marriage license it was just out of love it was out of love it's not that it was bad but it just got in the way 
got in the way. And so he says, repent. Somebody say repent. That just means this. Watch, watch me. I'm going to give you a physical illustration of what repent means. It's real simple. Bam. That's it. Turn around. Stop going that way. It's going to kill you. Stop going that way. I love you. Stop going that way. So whoever's in the house, the Lord is saying, turn away from the things that are taking your heart away from me so that you can get to know me. Turn. That's what the Lord says. He says, turn. And I used to think it, you know, you know just all this. And the Lord convicts me over and over. He said, you have the wrong tone when you're preaching sometimes, son. And you need to repent. I didn't say it like that. I know you're a nice, fiery, passionate preacher and all that, but, but I didn't say it like that. And I'm like, Lord, forgive me. He says, this is tender, not from a judge, but from a lover. He says, you've left your, the love you had at first. He says, turn back to me. It's tender. Forgive me if I've ever preached this heart. This is tender. Some of y'all knew that um, I was planning to go. I, I like going out into the woods and stuff. I know, I know a lot of people that look like me, a lot of the black folk don't mess with no woods, but I'm different. So I, since I was a little boy, maybe because I was, grew up 25, 15 Casey Avenue right there, and all we had was a big old yard. I was by myself, and I had all these trees, and I would just be back there by myself since I was a little boy. And so I like being by myself out in the trees. And so I went out there because I thought I was going out there, Amy, to just pray and say, Lord, what you got for our church? It's exciting. I know what we're doing. Man, we're going to do some. Got our joy community starting. We got 3310. We got 3310. We got to go out there and pray again. Lord, we're going to build a building. We're going to go and reach the city. And I got to this little cabin. And the Lord said, I got you out here to repent. I put the little cabin. I got my little, the little, the little cabin right there. And I call it my red cabin of repentance. But it's red, it's covered in the blood. And you know, we be going far with stuff, like covered in the blood. It's red. God got me. But that's my red cabin of repentance. Where the Lord told me, you have lost your first love. And I don't know about you, I'm just being personal for a minute, but if you've been walking with Jesus for a few years, few months, or whatever, one, for me, one of the ways that I immediately know, Dante, that I don't love him like I used to is what I do in the morning. I'm just saying, that's for me. I've noticed that a good measuring rod of my love for the Lord is what I do in the morning because when I first met him I couldn't hardly go to sleep because I knew as soon as I got consciousness that 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 I was going to get to be with the one who saved me my conscience was an alarm clock to run to Christ that's what my conscience meant when I was conscious it was alarm clock like oh Lord I, I still know the Lord. I, I, oh, oh, I can't wait to keep reading. I can't wait. Like Psalm 90, verse 14. That was one of my favorite verses. It says, satisfy me in the morning. I said that the other week. Uh, one of the practical things that bless God's people for putting God first in the morning is that you allow Jesus to beat your anxieties to your heart you allow grace to beat your favorite lust to your heart. When, because the devil and your anxieties and your idols are circling your bed, waiting for you to wake up so that they can attack you again. But when your consciousness drives you to Christ first, you put on your whole armor. Not at night. Yeah, you might have some bad dreams. Maybe you, you can do that too. But the armor is meant for the morning. Every soldier knows, get up and get ready. Because you don't know what kind of darts are coming. You don't know what kind of bullets are coming. You don't know what kind of aircraft is going to drop some bombs on you today. Get up out of your bed. And guess what? Reaching for this is not going to help you as much as reaching for this first. 
It's the battle over the Bible and the phone. And Zach, I, I looked at a couple of the, my old, early, a few old school brothers that really helped to shape me, a dude named Robert McShane from Scotland who died when he was 20-something years old. He wrote in his journal, and I'm just reading this stuff. I'm like, Lord, why am I reading this stuff? I didn't even know I... He wrote in his journal way back in the day, quote, I rose early to seek God and found him whom my soul loves. Who would not rise early to meet such a one? I was like, that shaped me early on. And then my African hero, I don't know if y'all familiar with Samuel Moore's, a.k.a. Prince Kabu. Y'all need to research, brother from West Africa. This man went to be with Jesus at 20 years old, and God used him on Taylor University campus in Fort Wayne, Indiana, to transform a whole campus. A 19-year-old black man from Africa was so full of God, they said all he did was talk to his father. He didn't call it prayer. They said, what you doing, Samuel? I'm talking to my father. I see documentary. I'm like, this man is talking to his father. He's reading the Bible. He's telling people about Jesus. The whole campus, almost the whole city gets saved. And then I ran across one of my journal entries, and I had to look twice because I didn't remember this, Amy. I was like, this is what I wrote down. Rising up at 3 a.m. has changed my soul. Like, what? When was that? There was a season in Minnesota where the Lord would get me up at 3 o'clock. And I would go down into my basement and be with the one that my soul loves. So I just say, Lord, thank you for your patience. Thank you for your kindness. I repent. I'm sorry. You can have my heart again. But I got some good news, y'all. I got some good. I want, to, I, want, I want us to look at a few scriptures, and then I'll, I'll, I'll let us go. The good news is the secret to close friendship and loving intimacy with Jesus is not found in your love for him. I'm going to say that again. The secret to deep intimacy with Jesus is not found in your love for him. Your love for him, haven't you recognized, is too fragile and too unfaithful. The secret to Lasting intimacy with Jesus is not trying to dig into your love for him, but to re-experience his steadfast, unending, all-consuming love for you. We don't need more teaching. We don't need more books. We don't need more podcasts. We don't need more guilt trips. We don't need more arm twisted. We don't need more warning. We don't need more begging you. You better be with Jesus. Pray. Did you pray today? Did you read your Bible? We don't need that beyond all that. I'm convinced. I'm looking through the scriptures and I'm convinced that we must be lovingly and graciously drawn back to him. By him. The same way you got saved. The Father drew you to the Son. Jesus drew you to himself. If you stray away, if you want to get back to that place, if you've never had a desire for Jesus, he's got to draw you to him by his sweet, tender, beautiful love. That's what he's got to do. And so, I ain't going to stay seated, so I'm going to just... I want to look at some, some verses that, in, in a book that maybe you've never been in a church service. I'm going I'm to I'm say most of you may not have been through a, to a church gathering 
that has walked through verses in Song of Solomon. Song of Songs. And I'm going to throw them on the screen, but let me just say this real quick, real quick. Song of Solomon, Song of Songs, after Ecclesiastes, it's in the poetic literature section of the Bible. All right, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. It's a little book that, that most of us don't even read. Listen, watch this. This book is about married lovers. Married lovers. Can y'all say that? Married lovers. All right? I, I want you to understand that. I'm giving you a little. Now, 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 okay, we're talking about Jesus and me. So, Kempton, why would you take us to a book and look at verses about married lovers? I'm not yet married. I might be 17 years old. Like, I understand. Is this a marriage conference? You got to understand something. I don't have time to go into it, but let me just say this. Y'all listen up. Listen up to this. Jesus said in Luke 24 that all of the Old Testament, the history, the prophets, and the poetic literature is about him. That's the most profound thing you'll ever learn about the Old Testament. I don't care how many commentaries you have. The most profound thing that you will ever learn about the Old Testament is from the one who wrote it, Jesus Christ. And the most profound commentary on the Old Testament is when Jesus said, all those images and symbols in the history letters, in, 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 in the Psalms, in the poetic literature, all the prophets, they testify and talk about me. Okay, that's number one. So that tells us that some, some way, Song of Solomon is talking about Jesus. Now, even if you say, because on one level, it's about married lovers. Remember what we read? Did we read in Ephesians 5? It says that even the marriage lover relationship is about who? What is marriage about? What does it point to? Ephesians 5. Go back to Ephesians 5. They, they, they didn't lost them. I didn't lost them already. Here it is. A man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This refers to who? Yes, Song of Solomon is about married lovers, but married lovers are about Christ and the church. So listen through the lens of Jesus and his bride. And I want to show you some other verses that connect. So three, and then we'll pray. Okay, Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 16. Can you put that up? So... The bride is talking to the groom, and she says, Behold, you are beautiful, my beloved, truly delightful. This is what the Lord wants your heart to know, that he is beautiful, y'all. As this bride tells her groom, you are beautiful, my beloved, truly delightful. The Lord put this in the Bible so that you could see that about him. Because we are the ultimate bride that Song of Solomon points to, and Jesus is the groom. And the Holy Spirit wants us to see how beautiful he is so that reading won't be a burden, so that Christianity won't be like, oh, that ain't fun, I'm going to be with my people. No, no, no. Jesus is beautiful, meaning that you were made to see him. And my beloved, you, you are so lovely to me. And it says, truly delightful. He is the beautiful one. Unless you think I'm stretching that, go to the next verse. Look at what Psalm 27 says. It says, one thing have I desired. David says, one thing have I desired of the Lord. This I will seek, to dwell in the house of the Lord, to gaze upon the what? It's talking about Jesus. He's the only one called beautiful. In all the Bible, he's beautiful. That means all of your senses and your mind was made to look at him and be satisfied and overwhelmed. He is your pleasure. You were made for him. And you don't go to the law. You don't go to yourself to come back to him. He has to reveal and remind you how beautiful he is. Psalm 
I mean, Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 10. Look at this one. This is from the groom to the bride. Look at this. He says, my beloved speaks and says to me. So the, the bride says, my beloved speaks. Did you know Jesus speaks? Jesus speaks, and he says to me, arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. Have you ever heard Jesus say that? He's saying that to some of us now. Look, arise, I love you. You're beautiful. So he is called beautiful, but his bride is beautiful because she's been covered in his beauty. Do you know that Jesus sees you as beautiful? He doesn't see you through the lens of what you've done. He doesn't see you through the lens of what's been done to you. He's, he doesn't see you through the lens of your last 24 hours with him. He sees you through the lens of the beauty and the holiness that he's covered you in. If you are his daughter or his son, you're beautiful to Jesus. You're beautiful to the Father because he shared his own beauty with you and everything he is, he's making you apart from deity. He's not making you God, but other than God, he's making you everything that he is. And when he sees you, he sees beauty. He sees beauty in your brokenness. And he says, come away. Leave that phone and come away. He says this a hundred times a day if you're listening. Put down that phone and come away. Turn off the TV and come away. Put that food down right now and come away. Put those sweets down right now and come away. This is how we get wooed back to him. He speaks and we respond. Just in case you think that's just Song of Solomon, look at Psalm 27, verse 8. This is what he says. David said this. Look, watch this. Lord, you said... Lord, you said, what did you say, Lord? Seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, I seek. The Lord whispers to us all day long. The Father whispers to us all day long. He says, Lord, you said, seek my face. He says, I just want you to seek my face. I got so much grace for you. I want you to seek my face. You feel so lonely. I want you to seek my face. You feel so empty. I want you to seek my face. You feel he's wanting us to seek his face, not so that he can take from us, but to give to us. I got joy for you. I got peace for you. I got love for you. I got forgiveness for you. But I want you to seek my face because in my face you'll see your purpose. In, your, in my face you'll have wisdom. In my face you'll have satisfaction. And then David says, no wonder he's called a man after God's own heart. He says, your face, Lord, I'll seek. He'll keep saying it until the hundredth time, Kempton, you finally drop that stupid phone and get in my face because you were made for me. A different kind of face time. Different kind of FaceTime, time in his face. A different type of Facebook, your face in his book. Then the last one. I love this one. Song of Solomon 7, 10. Watch this. I belong to my beloved, and his desire is for me. I know, brothers, this seems real feminine. This seems real, like, desire, love, beauty. We need to understand that this is what we were created for, too. Not just our sisters. He says, I belong to my beloved. I belong to you. I belong to you. And his desire is for me. We're almost done, but I, I can I see your eyes? I just, I, Holy Spirit, please help us to understand this. Because I, I wasn't taught this. Do you know that God desires you? I 
I know, you know, you got desiring God, and, but actually, God writes desiring you. That's his ministry, desiring you. He says, his desire is for me, he wants me. So let me prove it one more time. John 17. I'm telling you, this is in the, it's, it's, it's everywhere. It's all over the Bible. It's not just in Song of Solomon. This is a very intimate time where Jesus is about to go to the cross. And Paris, he pours out his heart. And he's in prayer. And right before he goes to the cross, he prays the most intimate stuff. If you study John 17, it'll blow you away. And he prays something that's so big and so amazing to me that it melts my heart. This is what he says. He says, Father, I desire. Can somebody say desire? When the Son of God says desire, that's intimate, that's eternal, that's a bottomless desire. When you are God and you have a desire, that's infinite, that's holy. You can't get to the bottom. He's giving us a peek into his heart. He says, I desire, what do you desire, Jesus? I desire that they also whom you have given me. Remember I said that the, marriage, the relationship between you and God is a marriage? Well, Jewish fathers would go get the bride for their sons. Like Isaac sent the messenger to go get his, bride, his son a bride. This was the pattern. He says, Father, the, the, the bride that you went and got me, my people, this is what I, 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 the people you've given me, I want them to be with me where I am to see my glory. Jesus wants you to be with him. Jesus wants you to be with him. He's even praying to his father on his way to the cross. He's saying, I want intimacy. I want that embrace. I told you Christianity is about a loving embrace between a bride and a groom. That's what it's about more than anything. And Jesus is praying at the end of his life. Father, my desire, my heart. That those people that you went and you gave to me, those people that my desires, that, that they be with me. I want them, I can want them to see all of this glory. I want them to see all that you've given. I want you to see it all. I want them to see it all. When I married my wife, I came and I pursued her from Houston back to East St. Louis. I remember talking to my late uh, uh, father-in-law who's with Jesus now, and I said, I want... I said, Mr. Gilbert, I just want her to be with me. I desire your, your, your daughter. He looked at me kind of funny, too. I remember him say, he said, I don't know what I would do. He was from down south, so he had that down south. I don't know what I would do. You'd do anything to my baby girl. I said, I desire her. I want to come and show her all my glory in Houston. I ain't had no glory. I had a raggedy car. That's where the, that's where the analogy breaks down right there. I ain't, had, I ain't had no glory for it, but I just said, I desire. This is your husband. This is your groom. This is your savior. He desires you. And what did he do? And we're about to celebrate that. What did he do shortly after this prayer? What did our bridegroom king do out of great love for his bride to make sure that he would have you forever? Ephesians, this is the last verse. Notice it's in the context of marriage again. It's everywhere. Husbands, love your wives. How, Lord, how? as Christ loved his wife, the church, and gave himself up for her. He spilt his blood to make sure that you would be with him forever. He took the wrath of God, the rage of God, the judgment of God. Like, he, he, you know, you say, oh, will you die for your wife? I hope you'll die for your wife. Well, there's somebody who did. He 
died. Let's go back to, we keep, keep showing y'all, but I just can't. I, I got to go back to Tori and Janae and finish like we started. He died to bring you this. 